Good afternoon. We are delighted to have with us today Reverend Rob Gregson. Reverend Gregson is an ordained minister and he has an unusual position as the executive director of the UULMNJ. And we will ask him about his organization and what it does and about how moral lobbying is done at the grassroots state level in New Jersey and about his career path spanning two continents. Welcome. My first question to you, Rob, it's good to have you, is what is the UULMNJ? A very long acronym for a social justice ministry that's supported by all the Unitarian Universalist congregations in the state of New Jersey. The actual acronym stands for the Unitarian Universalist Legislative Ministry of New Jersey. It's a mouthful, but it really is to describe the organization supported by those congregations to further our public policy witness and to amplify the voices of Unitarian Universalists across the state. How is the UULMNJ related to Beacon UU Congregation here in Summit? The Beacon Congregation has very kindly donated office space to us, so we're located here in Summit, but our remit is the entire state. So for all of our member congregations, which are 20 right now, we are the, the public voice in the public arena for Unitarian Universalists and are very grateful to the Summit Congregation. Can you give me a brief history overview of the UULMNJ? UULMNJ was really the brainchild of the Princeton congregation, several of their lay members who were social justice activists, as well as their minister at the time. And the model they were following was one that I understand was begun in California. At this time now, there are roughly 25 social action networks across the country for Unitarian Universalists. At the time, there were only a few. And this small group decided to raise some, some fairly serious money and then to fan out across the state and to ask other UU congregations, would you be interested in joining us in creating an organization that would amplify each of our small individual efforts uh, particularly around legislation, but just in social justice advocacy in general. And that was the beginning about nine years ago of the UULMNJ. We've had a director for about seven or eight of those years, and now I'm the first full-time director. And an interesting point, though we're a small denomination, we're one of the only to have any director at all, but certainly a full-time director for a faith-based advocacy effort in Trenton and across the state. Even much larger denominations aren't putting the kind of resources that Unitarian Universalists are into this social justice voice. How many members are there? There are different ways of counting our membership because of the way we started. In fact, each individual congregation is a member of the UULMNJ and they pledge dues per each of their members to our organization. And that creates a real strong structure for us in the state, especially given what a small denomination, relatively speaking, we are. The other way I would look at it is in our e-blast that we send out, uh, and that is about various pieces of legislation, contacting your legislator, signing petitions, joining rallies. Uh, we have a, over 1,200 members on that list. And when you think that the actual membership of Unitarian Universalists across the state is roughly 3,000, that's nearly half of all members. So that's a terrific uh, terrific inroads into the congregations themselves. The website lists six main areas for activism. Criminal justice reform, economic justice, environmental protection, gun violence pre prevention, immigration reform, and reproductive justice. Which areas get the most attention? It's a good question and it fluctuates with time. You know, as various topics rise to the surface or fade a bit, then we're able to, to change as well because of the flexibility of our structure. I would say certainly the equal marriage, uh, equal marriage rights for gay and lesbian couples in this state was a huge one for us a few years ago. Uh, now I would say there's probably two main fo foci for that. One is our racial justice initiatives and that really does come out of the awakening, certainly of white America, uh, to the fact that the systemic racism that we've seen, particularly around criminal justice issues, the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration, and then the shootings in Ferguson, Baltimore. Um, 
th that we need to start really improving and building structures that remove that systemic racism from our culture. So that's been one of our major uh, focuses right now. The other one would be at the moment, particularly following uh, the Trump election and the uh, the strong Republican and conservative Republican influence on the House and Senate at the federal level is on supporting undocumented people. So we have a, a, a very strong program through our Immigration Justice Task Force, and we are hoping that we can in fact create uh, a program whereby every single UU congregation from the smallest to the largest is engaged on some level at supporting and standing up for witnessing to undocumented immigrants who are being at the moment so harshly penalized and families and communities really being ripped apart our policing being implicated in that and uh, and and does that follow our values or not so I would say racial justice criminal justice reform around racial justice and supporting immigrants are two of the major ones right now. How would you say New Jersey compares with other states in terms of racial justice and criminal justice? Uh, our self-understanding and certainly electorally we tend to be a more progressive state, uh, a blue state as people sort of short form, shorthand for it. But in terms of racial justice, in fact in New Jersey the picture is much more mixed. So two pieces of information, two facts that I've just discovered that are quite sobering for progressive New Jerseyans. One is that uh, the rates of incarceration of African American men across the nation are roughly, you are six times more likely to end up in jail than if you're white in this country, proportionally. In New Jersey, you're 12 times more likely to end up incarcerated as an African American male. That's a really sobering and shocking, you're twice, it's twice a, an already bad average. So we have a lot of work to do around why is that? Let's pick apart those reasons and figure out why that's happening and do something about it. And the second fact, uh, the second statistic is that in our youth criminal system, in the youth jails in New Jersey right now, 75% of the inmates are people of color. 75%, obviously not the percentage of people of color in the state. That's a shocking statistic and says we're doing things wrong across a range of issues and we've got to do better. And what actions has the UULMNJ done in the past that have brought about legislation victories? There have been a number. I've only been on the job for a year so I can speak about what I know and then what's coming up in the future. Uh, so I know that on the issue of the Equal Marriage Rights Act for gay and lesbian people. Obviously a, a major focus of interest for Unitarian Universalists, no matter their sexual orientation, for years now. And we were very important, especially coming from a faith perspective. When there were those on the other side saying, this is against God's order, we were very firmly on the side saying, that has nothing to do with it. This is a justice issue. And in fact, we understand the divinity of every person, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That influences what we think about gay marriage rights. So the other thing I think it's important for viewers to understand is the way legislation works, you have to work in coalition. And it's the efforts of many, many different people and factions that create change. And I would say, given that metric, we've been highly influential in our way in that we have stood up across those seven years on any number of issues across our, our issues, uh, our task forces. So for example, we've worked this year very hard and last on reforming our draconian solitary confinement rules that people can be years in solitary confinement. It breaks down their mental health and it's inhuman. It's a form of torture and a number of religious groups, including Unitarian Universalists, have been tireless in trying to get that changed. Uh, we were not successful only because the current governor did not sign that legislation, but we were highly successful in getting bipartisan support in both the Assembly and Senate. To, to stop that. Bail reform so that we're no longer a money-based system which privileges wealthy people and has nothing to do with risk. We've moved that to a risk-based system which is far fairer. Also uh, parole reform so that people who have not committed violent acts uh, are able and eligible for parole, something that has been quietly phased out of the criminal justice system quite unfairly for years, several years now. Uh, there's so many more. Uh, I'm only 
touching on a few, but really we've been there all along the way and we've been raising the, the moral voice. So we are able to say, look, we don't have a dog in this race. We're not a, uh, a single issue group. We're not, uh, our, our money doesn't come because we're focused on one particular thing. We're here for the long run. This is not a democratic issue. This is not a Republican issue. This is a moral issue. And that's so important uh, on the legislative front. No one else can do that. What, in your opinion, are the keys to influencing change? I think I just mentioned a moment ago that building effective coalitions is absolutely critical. So uh, that's one of the things, several groups that people will recognize that we've worked with quite closely. The ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, originally co-founded by Unitarians, by the way, interesting fact. Uh, we work with the Anti-Poverty Network. We work with Planned Parenthood. We'll work with anyone that has a progressive mindset and is willing to move some of these things forward for a more just world. Which media do you find particularly effective in promoting change? It's, it's become almost a cliche now, but of course social media is the way things are, are moving. And in fact, we're now into second generation social media. So what I've found effective is beyond even Facebook and Instagram or emailing. I mentioned the mass, the mass action alerts that we send out so that you, you'll know quickly what's happening. Come to Trenton, write your legislator, call your email, your legislator on this particular issue. Um, we are now moving even towards group text so that you get something very quickly that you can respond to very quickly. People, as ever, are pressed for time and we're trying to find more effective ways so that people can make their voices heard as Unitarian Universalists and citizens. And about yourself, what is your background? What led you to become a Unitarian minister and what led you to your position today? Well, by birth and by rearing, I'm a Pacific Northwesterner, but I ended up in, in Massachusetts for college. And Massachusetts is Mecca for Unitarian Universalists. It's where the whole movement, in many ways, was born, grew out of the Puritan and Pilgrim tradition. Uh, it was there, though I was raised in a very socially liberal family, did not know a thing about Unitarian Universalism, and I discovered it there. Um, as part of that discovery, as I, I considered ministry, I took a job working in the Office of Social Justice for the Office of Gay and Lesbian Concerns. Uh, I had come out in college, had had a very strong activist bent, uh, and was extremely impressed that the Unitarian Universalists and the Quakers were the ones, this is back in the early 90s, really working very openly on gay and lesbian rights got it they got it they were doing their work there wasn't unanimity but they were doing their work and i found that very moving and so after working three years in the denominational headquarters uh, on social justice i ended up going to seminary at harvard divinity school and then had my first job out of seminary as the full-time interfaith pilot project chaplain at an Alzheimer's assisted living center. So I was actually uh, serving not only the, the people living with Alzheimer's at the center, but even in some ways more importantly or as importantly with the staff and the families who were coming there. Uh, after that, I moved to New York. I uh, ended up as a parish minister, which was very important in my formation at a very small rural church out in western New Jersey. Uh, and after the seven years of that, took some time off, moved to London, and I had my first taste of uh, nonprofit community based ministry. I worked with the British Unitarian. Uh, church association and out of a very old chapel that was largely unused in East London, the equivalent of our Queens or Brooklyn here in New York City, uh, I worked with uh, to form uh, an organization called Simple Gifts, the Unitarian Center for Social Justice, which social action, which is still uh, still exists to date. And we began a very local. We served uh, hot meals to seniors and our, our STAR program was doing after school tutoring to the very low income families, largely immigrant families and largely Bangladeshi Muslim immigrant families. So we had this terrific American Unitarian Universalist uh, Bangladeshi Muslim connection in the midst of Cockney London. Uh, it was terrific. And out of that, after I moved back here, it it became a very good fit for ULMNJ. What are your plans for the future of the UULMNJ? Well, we have a number of, of uh, 
items. There, there are a number of issues that we're working on that I'm very excited about. One of them, as I mentioned earlier, is the possibility of creating a sanctuary state so that we sort of challenge each other as congregations to say, as you use, we are, despite being a small group, each one of our congregations, from the smallest to the largest, will find some way to support undocumented immigrants as they are being rounded up and un un harshly and unfairly penalized for just trying to start a better life, especially those with no or extremely limited criminal records. Um, that's something that I think is, is the sharp point of the spear right now and something we have to speak out about. It's absolutely critical. And the other one that's a little bit more long term, but I'm very proud of, began last summer and, and happened on the wake of, of some of the terrible shootings that we witnessed, uh, police officers shooting African-American men typically, uh, that we are now have a something called the Local Policing Black Lives Matter and You Use Toolkit. And what we've done is decided this needs to be an interfaith effort and it will be a toolkit that we will hand out to any congregation of any sort uh, to help them engage locally with their police, with law enforcement, with an analysis of systemic racism. So it's not a kumbaya moment about just being nice to the police. It's really working in partnership with communities of color to say to local police, we have a problem. It's not just your problem, it's all of our problems. And we need to halt these killings and we need to start a better relationship with law enforcement than communities of color have ever been allowed to have. And we need to be part of that. So whatever we can do to help bridge that divide, faith communities have a very special relationship even to police because we're so embedded in our local communities and that toolkit will be a way of helping congregations reach out to do that work and also to say by the way to law, law enforcement this is in your best interest not only because it's the right thing to do but it'll make you safer as well as allowing for greater safety that communities of color have rarely had if ever in our communities I'm very excited and we hope to roll that out by the fall of 2017 you use the word toolkit. Is it a program? Is it a, can you describe it more? Another way to describe it is as a mini curriculum. So it would be a step-by-step -step sort of best practices, nothing huge. We wanted to start in a realistic way, 20 pages, 30 pages of resources and a, a, and a guide that would be applicable across faith traditions, but also with specific pieces particular to faith traditions. So our working group is also an interfaith working group. We began it, but we really want to widen this out because we know that police will take us more seriously and it would be more representative of the entire community if it's an interfaith effort. And then out of that, that would be a phase one, and then out of that experience, once that toolkit is, is being used by congregations, then I think our next objective would be to say, all right, what's phase two look like? How do we take that initial connection, that initial attempt to bring this analysis of systemic racism to the local law enforcement and working with communities of color? You know, we're not the experts on this, they are. Uh, how do we then broaden that, deepen that, really create long-term change where we're supporting police but also watching police? And to be very upfront about that, this is our intention. We want to support you and we know it's our duty as citizens and it's our understanding of how the system is set up that we have to be watchful as well. Sometimes you've testified before the state legislature. Can you describe that? Yes, yeah. So the way it actually works is, uh, in, in New Jersey at least, the time for public testimony is when uh, a piece of legislation is before a particular committee. So typically we will find out from our various coalition partners or for some other, from some other venue that, uh, that there's a call for testimony uh, and that we need to stand up for a particular bill. So for example, for solitary confinement reform, you know, I would go and as a representative of Unitarian Universalism, I will wear my stole so I can be identified as a faith leader and I'll join with other faith leaders and other nonprofit civic action leaders uh, and our supporters, sometimes our task force chairs, other UUs, anyone who wants to come and give testimony. But now I have also a certain standing or, I, or I'm known by legislators, they see us over time and uh, I can speak directly from that moral perspective that this is something that we're concerned about and we need you to be concerned about this as well. So you're kind of like a moral lobbyist? 
So that's exactly right. And also I see my job is not only to be the professional or the expert, but to really find ways of integrating Unitarian Universalists and anyone who's interested in joining us in this work. You don't have to be a U to support U Om and J to be able to find their way in too. So for example, our task forces are volunteer run, chaired, and they're made up of volunteers of people who are interested in those specific issues. So you could be on the environmental justice task force and be working on the renewable energy bill, for example, or figuring out ways to support deleading water, lead abatement in our water supply so that our children, especially poorer children, aren't exposed to the harmful levels of lead that they currently are. And there will be a monthly conference call. There, You'll find out up to the minute news about what's going on. And then we figure out ways to pressure and convince legislators that they need to vote in this particular way. Do you have any particular legislators that you work with regularly? You call them on things? For sure, for sure, yeah, there are some legislators who work with us. We're very, uh, though we have 501c4 status, which allows us to do political lobbying of legislators, we're very clear, because we also have 501c3 status, which makes us a nonprofit, we're very clear about keeping a boundary between partisan activity and issue-based activity. We'll work with anyone on any issue, as long as it's an issue that fits our Unitarian Universalist principles uh, and our traditions. Uh, and the needs of our constituents. So uh, I will work, we work quite often, we try to be as bipartisan as we possibly can be, but there are certainly some legislators in a more progressive vein who work with us quite a bit. We're very excited at the current moment to have Senator L uh, Loretta Weinberg from Bergen County, a state senator, to be a primary sponsor of a, our first piece of legislation, a signature piece of legislation that we've sponsored that would provide address confidentiality protection to uh, clinicians, healthcare workers in women's healthcare clinics, including abortion providing, providing clinics, uh, so that they don't have to be terrorized in their work by anti-abortion, some radical fringe anti-abortion activists. That is a protection, address protection that's been granted to, to domestic violence survivors, but not yet to women's reproductive health care workers. And we are, we've drafted that legislation through our legislative advocacy project, which has a, a law firm working with us in a pro bono basis and with now Loretta Weinberg's office. And as the majority House, uh, Senate Majority Leader, it's quite a coup for us to uh, be able to have that sponsorship of her office. If somebody's watching this and they want to help or they want to get involved, how do they get involved? Well, so I think the first step is to figure out how to be in contact with us. And you know, some of the obvious ways you could figure out, go to our website, www.uomnj.org. Uh, and there's on the home page, there are immediate ways to learn more, get involved. It's a very complete website. Uh, you can certainly follow us on Facebook, and that's another way to be in touch. But I also think the nice thing about our office is that it's very small, and you can certainly just speak with me directly. You know, we're not a huge organization, and that is a real strength, and that we know our people. And I would funnel you, find out what your interests are. What are you passionate about? What are you worried about? You know, uh, are you feeling stuck? And I can help sort of direct you in, a, in, a, in an area, probably around one of those six task forces, but perhaps in other things as well. We had a huge music festival of all, uh, a number of choirs, nine different choirs and musical groups from across the state. You know, there's fun things to do as well. And I think that's important to combine those, those worlds more, the spiritual growing world and the world of sort of sometimes the worried world of social justice activism and that's one strength of being a faith community involved with this we've got longevity we've got stick to itiveness are there any points we haven't covered that you would like to mention or talk about well, I, I alluded to this, or I said it briefly, but I'd like to say it uh, again more, knowing this is going out to the general public. You don't have to be a Unitarian Universalist or even know what that means to find out more and to become involved with us. One thing you should know is we're a non-creedal tradition. You don't ever convert to be a Unitarian Universalist. You get to keep your own opinions, your own thoughts. What really binds us together actually has to do with how do you act? What are, how do you lead your life? You may believe many different things about ultimate reality. It's hard to know the true answers for that. 
we say as long as you have a sort of open heart and a welcoming mind and uh, you have a general sort of progressive bent, however you define that, you are more than welcome to join with us and you needn't be a Unitarian Universalist to do that. And I think in some ways that's the wave of the future as well. There will be people who may never go to one of our congregations or who may discover Unitarian Universalism and that's fine. We don't have the only way. We have one way that may work for you. Uh, but if you believe in this same platform, basic human decency, and moving forward, not stepping back into not good times for many people in this country, uh, this might be a way to get involved and to shake off some of the blues about what's going on in the country right now. Okay, Reverend Rob Gregson, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, it was a pleasure.